Hello, and welcome to another video on competition law. Videos where we try to visualize some of the core concepts of competition regulation. In this video, we will go through some of the economic theories that are relevant for competition law and also other regulated areas, addressing the following topics. One, why is understanding economics important when dealing with competition law? Two, basic understanding of companies' objectives. Three, how do companies price their products and services? And four, the concept of market power. The first question that you might ask yourself is, why do I need to have a basic understanding of economics, pricing, costs, market structure, etc.? I'm an attorney, and if I need help with economics, I refer the matter to an economist. Basically, competition law is about regulating companies' competitive behavior, which is linked to the objectives of companies, which to a large extent is to optimize their profit under the given market structure to the benefit of their shareholders. So let's take a look at some of the examples. One, agreements and cartels under Article 101. Under, under Article 101, the market structures are essential for the application of the provision as only an anti-competitive agreement infringes Article 101. Part of the assessment will focus on competitors, market positions, market power, barriers to entry, etc. Let's move to Article 102, Abuse of Dominance. Under, under Article 102, we will often check the price-based abuse. For example, prices are too high or too low and thus anti-competitive. Embedded in both is the need for a benchmark often expressed in terms of costs and how competition would have evolved under normal competition. Moving to three, merger control regulation. Merger control governs mergers that significantly impede effective competition in the common market. In that respect, competition will be significantly impeded if prices are expected to increase or quality drop post-merger. Once again, we need to consider what to expect both before and after a merger. And finally, moving to market definition, according to the notice on the de definition of the relevant market, two products belong to the same market if a 5 to 10 percent increase on one of the products is unprofitable because consumers of that product will just simply switch to the other product. In that respect, understanding that price increases may lead to a drop in quality sold is very central, just as understanding how costs affect companies' optimal pricing. A basic understanding is therefore required when dealing with these matters. But don't panic. All of these provisions leave plenty of room for legal arguments and interpretation, and thus bread and butter for lawyers. As already indicated, it's essential to understand the objectives of companies and how they price their products if you desire to understand the economics of competition law. Companies may have various objectives. However, generating a profit for their shareholders is for most companies the main objective. Other objectives may be to have a high degree of social responsibility or to be well perceived in society. The focus of the economics of competition law is how companies price their products to optimize their profit and how they compete in general. The most important factors influencing companies pricing are the demand and demand curve for products and the costs related to producing the products respectively. We will deal with the costs in a separate video. And today the focus is on only the notion of demand. Now, here is the focus of today's lecture. How do companies decide what price to charge for products and services, presuming they don't leave it to chance? Now, of course, embedded in this is that the company can actually set their prices. However, unless offering basic commodities with no brand value, for instance, like salt or oil, all companies have some control over their prices. The first important factor when companies are pricing their products is demand for their products. That is essentially you and your willingness to buy the product. In order to understand a company's price, it's essential to understand that consumers are different in respect to their willingness to pay for a product or a service. Some people are unwilling or unable to spend money in general, while others have preferences for products or services or just simply spend more money. Presuming you're a football fan or a whiskey lover, you are probably willing to pay a premium for special matches or brands, prices which others not sharing your preferences would be unwilling to even consider. 
Now, if you're a rich lawyer, you might also value time and comfort more than a student and may be willing to pay a premium for both when traveling. This essentially explains why planes and trains offer different levels of comfort on the same flights and hotels have different room grades. This provides for a demand curve expressing how many units a product a company will sell at a given price. A curve taking into account that few consumers are willing to pay a high price and many consumers are willing to pay a low price and that each consumer has different preferences in respect to a maximum price. As it appears from the curve, this particular company will only sell one unit if the price is 100 but will sell 90 units if the price is only 10. The maximum price which a consumer is willing to pay for a product is called the consumer's reservation price. Accordingly, the demand curve expresses how many consumers are willing to buy a product at a given price. The demand curve is downward sloping to express that more consumers are willing to buy the product at the reduced price, thus increasing overall demand. Embedded in this assumption, however, is that it's not possible to price discriminate and sell the same product at different prices. We will revert to this in a separate video. The downward sloping demand curve also indicates that some consumers find other alternative products or brands more attractive at higher prices, or that some consumers cannot or will not pay the high price. The demand curve does not express how the consumers value the product, but how the consumer values the product considering that other similar products are being sold by competing companies. The demand curve is therefore highly affected by the availability and prices of similar products. An example could be the price of a banana. Most of you are probably not willing to pay one euro or more for a banana in the cantina but maybe you would consider a price of 70 euro cents fair. However, if a mobile banana seller started to sell bananas in the front of the university for 30 euro cents, few of you would be willing to pay that 70 cents in the cantina. Furthermore, most of you would consider other forms of fruit as an alternative and thus switch your demand, perhaps, depending on the price of bananas. This feeds into the concept of the relevant market, which will be explored more in another video. Another important observation is that the turnover is neither maximized at a price of 100 nor at a price of 10, but at a price of 50. This follows from the downward sloping demand curve. If the price goes down, sales go up. Turnover is then calculated by multiplying the two figures provided for in the schedule. So, when reducing the price from 100 to 90, the effect on turnover of selling additional 9 units is greater than the loss related to selling at 90 instead of 100 on all units. This is so until a price of 50. At a price of 40, the increase in units sold is not enough to offset the price decrease on all units. This is clearly illustrated in the chart, which shows that turnover peaks at a price of 50. Now, presuming the company only seeks to maximize turnover, the ideal price would be 50. The consequences of a reduction in competition, for instance, due to two companies entering into a price cartel or because of a merger, may be illustrated by a shift in the demand curve. The illustrated shift from the blue to the red demand curve indicates that consumers have become willing to pay more for the product. That is, their reservation price has increased. This could be because the prices of substitutable products have increased or because there are no substitutable products being sold in the market anymore. Another consequence could be a reduction in quality instead of an increase in price. The effect on turnover and the op optimal is price is illustrated in the chart to the right. From the chart to the right, it is clear that at a price of 50, turnover is now much higher, which is now because more consumers are willing to buy at a price of 50. Furthermore, the turnover maximizing price drops from 50 to 40, which is a consequence of the increase in sold units due to a lower price. Before jumping to the conclusion that a reduction in competition is per se positive, please bear in mind that this is demand for this 
particular specific company's products. The second important factor when companies are pricing their products is the cost of producing these products. We will explain more about costs in a separate video, but today confine ourselves to only cost implications for the pricing issue at hand. On the previous slides, the uh, effect of lowering prices was explained, and it was shown that the turnover was not maximized with a high price, but with a price of 50 or 40. However, a company is not interested in maximizing turnover, but again in maximizing profit, which is also why costs must be considered. When including costs of 40 per unit, it becomes clear that a price of 50 is not profit maximizing, but that of a price of 70. The difference between maximizing turnover and maximizing profit is further illustrated with the chart. As it can be seen, the red total profit curve peaks before the blue turnover curve because the former takes the cost of producing each unit into account. It also shows from the chart that the red total profit curve becomes negative when the price drops below 40. This is very logical, as the costs of producing one unit were exactly 40. 40 is therefore the lowest price it would make sense to sell at. In summation, the chart and the table show that lowering the price from 100 to 70 increase profit and that a further lowering of the price is reducing profit. However, the total profit stays positive until the price is reduced to 40. Optimal pricing may also be explained with reference to marginal revenue, which is the additional revenue on one additional unit sold, taking into account the decrease in price of the initial units. Okay. Let's slow down. This requires a bit of some explanation. In our example, we do not have information per unit, but per 10 units. Now presume the price is lowered from 80 to 70. That would result in an increase in turnover from 1,600 to 2,100, which is an increase in turnover of 500. The marginal turnover there, therefore on these 10 units is 50. Lowering the price will increase profit so long as the marginal revenue is higher than the marginal cost, which were 40. Therefore, lowering the price from 70 to 60 will not improve profit as the marginal revenue drops to 30. The optimal price is therefore 70 and not 60, according to the table to the left. However, the chart to the right indicates that the optimal price might be somewhere between 70 and 60. What we have just gone through can also explain the concept of market power. As indicated by the dotted line in the chart, the profit maximizing price is 70, and at a price of 70, 30 units are sold. This turnover may be calculated as 70 multiplied by 30 equals 2,100. The previous chart may also be used to illustrate how much of the turnover is allocated to costs and how much to profit. This gives an indication of the profitability of the company, but also of the degree of competition in the market, as large profits are often associated with a low degree of competition, whereas small profits are associated with a high degree of competition. Market power is expressed as how large a proportion of the price that can be kept by the company as a profit, and the calculation is price minus costs divided by price. In the example used, market power may be calculated as 70 minus 40 divided by 70, which is 43%. So this company gets to keep 43% of the price as a profit. If there had been more competition in the market and the demand curve would have shifted downwards, then the optimal price for the company would have been lower and the calculated market power would have been lower. This way of calculating market power is also known as the learner index. Now, don't think market power is bad per se. As explained initially, all companies are perceived to have some level of market power unless offering simple commodities. Secondly, market power generates a profit that can be spent on product innovation and attract capital in the first place. A moderate level of market power thus fuels competition in the form of better products in a longer, more dynamic perspective. 
Market power is only problematic then if it is significant and persistent, but we will explore that in another video. We hope that this simple video has helped to clarify how companies price products in light of demand and costs. This is essential for understanding more complex competition law concepts to be explored in subsequent videos. As always, feel free to send questions and comments using the provided email. Thank you very much for listening.